Hi, this is Bart Paulson, and this video is to review the first online quiz for Chapter 4 on Early Childhood for the class Lifespan Development. The first question on this quiz is, during early childhood, girls and boys tend to gain about how many inches in height per year? So it's a simple physical question. The choices are 1 to 2, 2 to 3, 3 to 4, or 4 to 5, and Obviously, we're going to be talking about averages because uh, individual children are going to be all over the place on this one. But uh, according to our textbook, the answer is two to three inches. In fact, uh, you may recall seeing a slide that looked like this at one point. Girls and boys tend to gain about two to three inches in height per year, and weight gains remain fairly even at four to six pounds per year. That's during middle childhood, excuse me, early childhood. Anyhow, um, the second question is Miranda's mother watches her daughter run down the street while singing at the top of her lungs. At what developmental stage did Miranda likely start this behavior? So would she have started it when she was a toddler, an early preschooler, an older preschooler, or an elementary, early elementary, geez, early elementary schooler? Well, uh, in this case, the answer is older preschooler. And let's take a quick look because running down the street and singing it's going to talk a lot about motor development. And uh, you may recall seeing this slide before. During the preschool years, children make great strides in the development of gross motor skills. So that's, you know, large body organization. And running and jumping are going to be a big part of that. And by age four or five, they can pedal a tricycle quite skillfully. And that's about the time period they were talking about for this girl running down the street. The third question. Daniel sits on the kitchen floor banging on a plastic bowl with a wooden spoon. That's what we refer to as a non-sophisticated behavior. Um, at what age will this type of motor activity likely begin to decline? And the choices are one to two years of age, two to three years of age, three to four years of age, or four to five years of age. I swear, sometimes it feels like, guess what number I'm thinking. Um, but the answer here is two to three years of age. Now let's take a look at not banging plastic bowls, but a similar thing that does relate to development and motor development. And you see here, age two to three, we have the uh, drawings on the left. They're squiggles, they're just squiggles. And then we start to get shapes and design at three to four, and we actually get recognizable pictures at you know four to five. And so the child sitting on the floor banging on the, uh, the plastic with the spoon, that's gonna be the squiggly stage here that we have on the left, so two to three. And at that point, after that, we would see it taper off. All right, number four. Sophie's three-year-old son, Sam, refuses to eat vegetables. Not an uncommon behavior. According to this text, what would be the best way to get Sam to eat his vegetables? A, blend the vegetables together into with something sweet. Uh, B, offer him nothing but vegetables to eat for two days. C, use a reward or punishment system. Or D, introduce tiny amounts of vegetables on his plate at several meals. Well, if you're following the rule of choosing the long answer as the correct one, then you got it right. Introduce tiny amounts of vegetables on his plate at several meals. So let me go show you my little picture here. Kids will eat pasta. The bow tie pasta is pretty good. Kids will often eat uh, green pepper. You know, peppers are sweet. We got a little bit of broccoli sneaking its way in there. Broccoli's good for you, kids don't really like it. But if you make it a very small amount so they can get accustomed to the flavor, that's the idea. A very small amount on repeated occasions to get used to the flavor, then that can be something that really helps. Um, okay, question number five. What did, excuse me, what test did Piaget use to learn whether children at certain ages are egocentric or can take the viewpoints of others. Again, when we're talking egocentric here, we don't mean vain and self-absorbed. What we mean is literally centered around the self and unable to take the viewpoint, the physical viewpoint of others. Did he use the four tiers test, the three mountains test, the five skyscrapers test, or the six points test? Well, um, the answer is the three mountains test. Let me show you what it looks like. And what you have on the left is a child is seated where you are looking at it. And so the uh, the mountain with the cross, that's our little Rio de Janeiro, I don't know, is on the right. The one with the cylinder is in the middle and the plain one is on the left. But if you rotate the whole thing 90 degrees to the left, so the child is now seated on the left side, you see that the perspective has changed. The one with the cross is now in the middle. Um, and a child will be unable to make that adjustment that if somebody's sitting in a different place that they would... The, the mountains would change their relative position because they assume that everybody sees it the way they do. 
And that is the Piagetian concept of egocentrism as opposed to the social impairment. Okay, number six. Three-year-old Hannah watches Sesame Street every morning. According to research studies, how will this affect her cognitive skills? So she's watching TV. She's watching Sesame Street. The choices are no effect, it's got a negative effect, it's got a positive effect, or it's got a variable effect. Well, um, there, there's been a number of research studies on uh, Sesame Street in particular, and overall they find that there is a positive effect. In fact, let me pull up a little infographic from the Sesame Street people. We've got Grover here. 16% of the kids who watch Sesame Street, of uh, the preschoolers, um, get high school grade point averages that are almost 16% higher than those who don't. That's fascinating. Over 90% of uh, parents reported change in their children's interest in counting, sorting, and matching as a result of the materials. Now, please take this as correlational. It could also be that, you know, obviously, if you're going to watch Sesame Street, you got to have a TV. Um, you got to live in a house where you actually have time to watch TV. You know, there's a number of things that go into it. But overall, as a predictor, it is a positive association. All right, question number seven. While visiting the House of Reptiles, that's at the zoo, Four-year-old Montel is excitedly shouts out, look at that tongue, mommy, as he points to a snake sticking out his tongue. Montel's two-year-old sister, Sage, now thinks that snakes are called tongues. Why does she make this incorrect assumption? So he was trying to point out the snake's tongue. His sister thought she was just talking about the entire animal. So that could be either the whole object assumption, the proximity assumption, the overextension assumption, or the focal assumption. Well... Lots of interesting terms. The one we're talking about here, though, is the whole object assumption. That is mistaking one element for the entire thing on, in and of itself. Now, if you've taken English, you know that there's a concept uh, similar to this. And it's what's called synecdoche, uh, which is a form of metonymy, which is a form of metaphor, where one thing is taken to stand in for something else. And synecdoche, um, the, the phrase all hands on deck, where an an element of something, the hands of the people who work on the ship. So all hands on deck, get all the hands of all the people who work here on the boat, and then we can take care of something. So that's a common way of talking about it. Um, but that assumes that a person is old enough to understand metaphor. Uh, and in this question we had, that is not the case for the two-year-old. All right, question number eight. The motto of an authoritarian parent is likely to be what? because I say so. Parents have rules because they care. Be free, be yourself, or children should not be seen nor heard. Well, an authoritarian parent is going to say, do it because I say so. Uh, this is the iron fist parent. And you may recall this little table here. We talked about two dimensions of parenting. On the left here, I have warmth and responsiveness. Basically, are they interested? Do they care about the child? Do they like the kid? And then across the top is restrictiveness and control. Um, and again, you can also think about it in terms of putting dim, you know, expectations on there because high restrictiveness control can be a good thing. Um, low warmth and responsiveness can't. And so you get this uh, combination here on the top right where you have low warmth and responsiveness. So basically they don't like the kid, but high restrictiveness, restrictiveness and control. And that's an authoritarian parent. That's bad. It's the bottom right, the authoritative, that's considered the good one. In fact, all three of them are, the three of them are bad. It's just the one on the bottom right that's considered positive generally. Well, and there's research to support that it has uh, better outcomes. Okay, number nine. According to which theory do children form concepts about gender and then fit their behavior to those concepts? Okay, there's a lot of work on gender. Your choices here are gender schema theory, social cognitive theory, psychodynamic theory and cognitive developmental theory. All of these are legitimate theories. Now the question really is, which one of them actually talks about children forming concepts about gender and then shaping their own behavior to match? Well, in this case, it's cognitive developmental theory. This comes from Lawrence Kohlberg, who had what the cognitive developmental view of gender. Kohlberg is much better known for his work on moral reasoning. But let's take a quick look at three things that he talked about. Kohlberg talked about gender identity, which is simply knowing that you're male or female. So how do you identify? Uh, gender stability is the idea that people retain their gender for a lifetime. They don't spontaneously change overnight. Or you're not born, a, say, for instance, a girl, and just happen accidentally to become 
a man. Um, and so it doesn't happen spontaneously. And gender constancy is more a situational characteristic that changing your, for instance, your clothing or the, you know, what you do does not temporarily change your gender. And so these are the cognitive developmental theory uh, of Kohlberg on gender. All right. Question number 10. Which theory asserts that children observe the behavior of adult role models and come to assume that their behavior should conform to that of adults of the same gender? Okay, the choices are gender schema, social cognitive, psychodynamic, and cognitive developmental. Same choices we had a moment ago, except now we're talking about a different situation, and we're looking now at the social cognitive. Uh, to pick a rather humorous, you got to laugh to keep from crying, uh, stereotype version here. Uh, apparently, we have an instruction manual here for people who were not clear that boys are football players, girls are cheerleaders, and that boys are pilots and girls are stewardesses. A stewardess walking very fast with a uh, with a shake in her tray. Anyhow, um, just sort of really strongly reinforcing cultural stereotypes, but that does fit in with the social cognitive view. Anyhow, that is the end of the first quiz on early childhood. That's chapter four for lifespan development. Thanks for watching.